key seats right across the country. His unity with Uluru Kenyatta as the National Alliance brought us to a near similar to position Kenya was again in 1973. So powerful was Jama that time that in the election held the following year, the candidates that endorsed nearly all won seats in its territory. Now think of Jama as URP and think of TNA as can you and you will see what Jean Baptiste Carr meant when he said that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Jama's alter ego. In many ways, Jama was the prop that Kanyu leaned on in its central Kenya strategy. Virtually all the MPs and Kanyu bosses were card carrying members of Jama. In 2013, URP was the prop that Jubilee Alliance lent on in its Rift Valley strategy. So it could be just as well if URP had made their slogan Kimwakiai. URP was Jama's indubitable doppelganger. But don't be fooled that URP really dissolved and joined Jubilee. Its core remains intact just as Jamas does. The URP affirmed the cult of Ruto and its core will stop at nothing until he becomes president. Succeeding Uru Kenyatta We are entering a period that will be characterized more by the intrigues of succession. Just as it was in 1970s. At that time. Jama set itself on the succession debate with the mind to keep power in the mythical house of Mumbi. Its biggest lieutenant was Kaihika Kamani, whose daughter Senator Susan Kaihika is today, ironically, a great ally of Ruto. Her father had no time for Vice President Mwa nor did Njenga Karum, who was the chairman of Jama. The succession debate quietly began as early as 1966, when Jamo Kenyatta suffered a heart attack and this caused his cousin, Dr. Njoro Jmungai, a medical doctor no less, to closely monitor his health. He later suffered a slight stroke in May of 1968, prompting even closer monitoring. Dr. Mungai even caused a medical doctor to constantly accompany the president wherever he went, disguised as a district officer. Essentially, the Mzi was living on borrowed time and it was right for them to discuss his succession. In the middle of the two health scares, in January 1967, Daniel Arap Mwa entered the scene as the heir apparent to Kenyatta. The thought of a Mwa presidency was quickly abhorrent to the inner Jama circle, which preferred instead to have Mbikoi Inange or anyone else succeed Kenyatta. Backstabbing Boss The succession debate was something of a nil win that just couldn't go away. In the next few years, it became increasingly hotter. At some point, it molted into the Change the Constitution movement, which was meant to bar the automatic accession of the vice president to the presidency. At this time, everybody thought Kenyatta was solidly behind his deputy. At least that was the perception he portrayed in public. However, in private, it is now very clear that President Kenyatta was behind the Change the Constitution thing all along. At a 1977 rally hosted at Tinderet Secondary School, now Kilabwoni High School, in Nandi called to drum up popular support for the Change the Constitution movement, all its protagonists led by Kamani, Mungai, Karum and more, were hosted by Tinderet MP Gerald Kalia. Speaker after speaker insisted that Mwa could not become president and during a break. Kalia was taken by Kamani to the school staff room where President Kenyatta was getting a minute-by-minute -minute account of what was going on through the school telephone. Holding the handset, he gave it to Kalia, who very surprised to speak to Kenyatta on the other end. Kenyatta told him to keep up the good work. It is not clear why Jamo Kenyatta did not outrightly sack Mwa immediately but sure enough, he was not Mwa's biggest fan. But Jamo Kenyatta was living on borrowed time. His heart gave way in Mombasa exactly one year later. Ruto and 2022 Deputy President William Ruto will probably not encounter the kind of resistance that Mwa had but what is sure, is that there will be several situations that might just make it difficult for him to be president. Already, the record of succession of any deputy to the throne is at best poor and at worst impossible. There has never been a vice president in Kenya who directly went on to become president succeeding their boss through an election while in the same party. 
Kibaki only became president through an opposition-led coalition that ended Kanyu's reign which by 2002 was indeed a spent force. It had died back in 1966 and its zombie continued terrorizing Kenyans until 2002, when Kibaki chopped off its head. So, this is the reality facing Ruto ahead of 2022. He could just wait until that day to make his presidential bid but then he could just fail under what we described a while back as the curse of deputization. The curse of deputization. The country which has had the most vice presidents in its history is the United States. They adopted the presidential system in 1776, when George Washington successfully defeated the British and declared independence in July of that year. Since then, there have been 48 vice presidents, including the current one Mike Pence. Only four went on to become president directly succeeding their bosses, although a total of 14 former vice presidents did become president. Virtually in all the regional countries, very few of its vice presidents went on to become president succeeding their bosses directly. In Kenya, Jaramagi Ojinga Odinga was replaced in 1966 by Joseph Morambi who resigned after only three months paving way for Mwa. Morambi was reportedly very disturbed at the death of his personal friend Pio Gama Pinto in the hands of an assassin Mwa has Kenyatta's health problems to thank for becoming president. Mwa Kibaki, Joseph Atkaranja, George Saititi, Mazalia Madavati, Kajana Wa Malwa, Moody Wa Uri, Kalnzo Musioka never became president, succeeding their bosses directly through an election. You could add Prime Minister Rayla Odinga to that list. Curse of the Buildings Some have even opined that the offices occupied while in government could just be jinxed. One is the official residence of the Deputy President in Karen, occupied by Kalnzo briefly before Ruto got in. The other is the former Shell BP house that became the office of the Prime Minister, and which DP Ruto took over. The two houses were said to have been jinxed and could not lead its immediate occupant to ascend to the next level. Of course, Kenyans will explain failure at the polls with anything, including blaming jinxes. Perhaps aware of the potency of the jinx, DP Ruto had the building immediately rechristened Harim B House Annex, showing it to be an extension of the office of the president. In a way, they could just be brother buildings. No taking chances. While indeed the electoral landscape looks rather promising for Ruto, there is a way in which circumstances can begin to play with your chances. Rayla had a very clear path to the presidency in 2013, there was no impediment to his chances and his attitude reflected as much. Until two young men appeared on the scene and, like a hurricane, turned things around against him. In short, anything can happen. You could have it all right now and in the next minute the landscape has instantly changed. Gideon Moa still remains the thorn in Ruto's smooth run in the Rift Valley. He acts as though Ruto does not exist and his friendship with Uru is in spite of Ruto's position. A debt of gratitude remains with the Kenyatta family, who fully understand that it was President Moa who pitchforked Uru and thrust him on the path to the presidency. But as long as President Moa is still alive, the hopes of Gideon to become president remain alive. Gideon has tended to rely on his father to fight his political battles and has never muscled his way to the national scene without first checking what his father has to say. In fact, on the back of such hesitancy, Kanyu is only surviving as a ghost. But even then, it could just pull a major upset against Trudeau. Being made president Political analyst Mutai Ngunyi once told DP Ruto that he will never become president, but will be made president. In Kenya's politics, it is very hard to arise politically to the highest seat on the land without some sort of deal with various sections of the country. Until the foreseeable, no single individual will occupy the presidency without cutting a substantial deal with others. So Ruto must be made president through a deal like the one that propelled Uru to the seat five years ago. Already, there are many quarters that are strongly against Ruto, and NASA are indeed his biggest haters. The energy he displayed on the campaign trail is unmatched. He was properly resourced, had a good message and was literally campaigning everywhere meeting people here and there. Even then, 
It will take more than that to overcome in 2022. He will need incumbency to be sure of 2022. Dealing with the curse of deputization. Yurusha then stepped down for Rudo in 2021 just a year to the polls and let him test run the presidency. This will give him a much better chance of going through and winning in the 2022 poll. This will effectively eliminate the curse of deputization. Of course such a proposal is likely to galvanize the opposition and make them even more determined to remove him in 2022. However, with good resources and Jubilee's voting bases remaining solidly behind Rudo, he will then have a much better chance of making it to the presidency. There is a strong ongoing debate as to who will become the running mate of Rudo in 2022. There are those who have positioned themselves for the deputy presidency, including Devolution C.S. Mwangi Kyunjuri, who has his lieutenants already pitching him for the seat. There are those who are betting on Governor Anwayaguru. Again the regional politics of Mount Kenya will come to play. Among the Kikuyu, there are hot internal politics between the Kayambu group, the Mount Kenya group, the Diaspora, Kenya, group and others as to the suitability of the deputy presidency. We will be closely watching this space.